Hello, I'm Kate Chabot. Welcome to BFBS SITREP, your weekly look at the big issues in defence and world affairs. The UK helps train many air forces around the world, like Qatar and Saudi Arabia. Our staff college educates officers from many countries, including China. So why the outrage at former RAF pilots who have gone to China to train their air force? It seems to me, regardless of what's written in rules, it's morally reprehensible and it's the worst form of mercenary activity that I've ever seen in the military. A former senior officer and professor of defence studies, Michael Clark, will help us assess the risks, complexities and possible solutions. In Ukraine, the capital has suffered more airstrikes. We explain the programmable flying bomb that's wrought havoc in Kyiv. It can go and fly above an area for several hours. The payload is probably, say, four times the size of a Hellfire missile. And we have the tales of six women war correspondents who got closer to the action than their male counterparts in World War II because the military tried to stop them. The attitude of the military was essentially that wars were not for the weaker sex, that somehow there was something dangerous about women being present. And most uncomfortably of all was the issue of toilet facilities. If you had served your country and put your life on the line, would you be prepared to work for a potential enemy once your days in uniform were over and you needed a new job? What if that potential enemy was being treated as a potential partner for defence exports and security programmes just a few years ago? And would a pay packet of more than £200,000 maybe affect your decision? Have a think. I'll give you a sense of other people's answers shortly. This is, of course, all about the revelation that around 30 British veterans, many of them former fighter pilots, have been training the Air Force of the People's Liberation Army in China. Uh, Mike, it's, it's worth pointing out defence sources say those doing the training are not breaking any laws or sharing any secret technology. Their worry is the sharing of British TTPs, tactics, techniques and procedures. What, what do you make of this? Is, is it more complex than it might first seem or is it cut and dried wrong for these veterans to be training China? Well, no, it's not, it's not wrong in one sense because this is soft diplomacy. You know, this is actually soft power. And of course, China was a, an edgy partner until relatively recently and then the uh, integrated review and British defence reviews and statements since have made it very clear that we now see China as an adversary for some pretty good reasons. I mean, there's a long history of, of this sort of thing. The, the first, the Foreign Enlistment Act goes back to 1819. The great Admiral Cochrane, he fell foul of it because he trained and operated in for Peru and Chile and Brazil. But we've never really enforced it very much. I mean, there's always been an ambiguous relationship between what British personnel are allowed to do in foreign fields, which is by and large a good thing and where it affects our particular interests it's a very gray area but i think the professional answer is that these people ought to have had the the savvy appreciation of the fact that if you train chinese pilots um, you're actually helping a potential enemy in 10 years time i don't think there's any way around that one even if the law can't quite cover it well, here's a snapshot of public opinion. In an online poll for BFBS SITREP, just over three quarters said a firm no, they would not train Chinese forces, even for £200,000. But 17% said yes, they would. That's a bit more than one in six people. 6% 6 of the 280 people who took part weren't sure. Well, the Ministry of Defence has promised decisive steps to stop this kind of British thinking being shared with China or other potential enemies. Among forces communities, the revelation has angered many, including retired Air Vice Marshal Sean Bell, himself a former Harrier pilot. At first, I thought that let's get to the truth behind what's actually going on. I'm sure this can't be true. Uh, I went through my Royal Air Force Harrier colleagues. None of them knew uh, anybody in the Harrier Force had been involved in this, but they did identify some folks who had been, are out in China at the moment. And um, universally, they have been condemned for what they're doing. We all served our Queen and Country at the time, obviously King and Country now. My son is a pilot in the Royal Air Force. We are training 24 and 7 to provide a credible military deterrent and capability against our nation's potential enemies. China is one of those potential enemies. And to know that we have people helping them improve their military capability is completely outrageous. So from the way that you're talking, am I right to assume that you yourself have never actually been approached in this way? 
No, I've never been approached. I suspect they are quite careful about who they approach. I mean, I think we also have to put this into context because uh, the Ministry of Defence has got uh, does an awful lot of international defence training. We run a staff college where we have people from Russia, from China, and many of our potential enemies are there. In fact, there's nobody from Russia there at the moment, but they do do international defence training, which is part of defence diplomacy. The key difference, though, is all of these activities are foreign office led. So they have government endorsement. Yes, because, you know, we're told that what's at risk here is not our fighter jet technology, which would be covered by the Official Secrets Act, but information on how we carry out our air operations. Now, as a layman, you might think that's not so secret. You can't hide in the skies the same way a camouflage soldier on the ground can. What sort of secrets are at risk here? Well, it's less about secrets, to be brutally honest. If, if it was about secrets, I think the Ministry of Defence would be very quick to take action. I think this is more about tactics, training and procedures. Let's put it into context again. To train a military pilot from the day he arrives in the Royal Air Force to finishing his first tour, in other words, three years on the front line, after which he's got just about enough experience to be operationally effective, the country has invested about £100 million in him. It's an incredibly expensive enterprise. Not only do we spend a lot of money training the best pilots in the world, they also have huge operational experience. That experience, which is not necessarily secret, but the ways that you can move from a textbook to hearing about it from battle-hardened warriors, that is where that can make a material difference to a nation's operational capabilities. That's the worry. The thing is, though, if we're training them already at Staff College, aren't we giving them some insight already? We are, and that's, the, that's part of the challenge. If I was to talk to one of these individuals, I'm sure they would turn around and say, we're not sharing any secrets. We're simply uh, helping them meet their own doctrine. And if there was one crumb of comfort in this is that it appears that most of the people I've heard about left the military some time ago and mm. our operational tactics and procedures are constantly evolving and they're very reliant on technology. Well, the government has promised rapid action to stop veterans training our enemies. This is some of what the Armed Forces Minister James Heapy has had to say. We have approached the people that are involved and been clear with them that it is our expectation that they would not continue. And we are going to put into law that once people have been given that warning, it would become an offence to then go forward and continue with that training. Don't go and train foreign air forces without checking with the MOD whether they're a foreign air force that we want to see you train would be a pretty good rule. And on top of that, Downing Street's promised a review of confidentiality clauses and non-disclosure agreements for former military personnel. Sean, when you left the RAF 10 years ago, did you have to sign any confidentiality agreements? Uh, were there any discussions about what work would or wouldn't be appropriate for you to take on? Yeah, very definitely. I think it, it depends. As a senior officer, when you're leaving, there is a lot of paperwork and uh, clearances you have to go through but you also um, you retain a reservist role the more junior you are when you leave the more you have to do another job and the challenge when you're a fast jet guy is that when you leave the military there isn't a natural job for you to do in civilian streets you could join, fly the airlines but that's a very limited number that, that can actually do that and therefore mm -hmm. several people leave and join military flying schools around the world. We've got people who go to Australia, to Saudi, New Zealand, etc. But all of that is an acceptable partnership. This is clearly different when it comes to China. Yeah. Does it actually specify uh, when you sign anything when you leave, what is an unacceptable partnership? Um, no, it doesn't. Uh, and again, we're talking 10 years ago, so I'm sure things have moved on. But I think what we're actually discussing here is the moral code here. It, it seems to me, regardless of what's written as rules, it's morally reprehensible and it's the worst form of mercenary activity that I've ever seen in the military. So will what the government's suggesting fix the problem? Well, I think there's a number of different ways of fixing the problem. And, and bizarrely, the very fact that this has now hit the news means that many people who otherwise might have just kept this activity under the horizon are now being thrown into the sharp spotlight. 
And whilst I wouldn't want to underestimate what the MOD can do, your peers blackballing you as a result of this will also be incredibly powerful. Of course, the moral code, I mean, it's all set in the geopolitical context. Because if we look back to 2015, the Defence Review was talking about growing ties with China on security challenges, economic ties, defence exports. We had the first Sea Lord visiting a Chinese warship in Portsmouth. Would we have barred veterans from working with China in that climate? I don't think this is, I think no, nobody's stopping people from working from China. However we feel about uh, lots of different nations, defense diplomacy is very powerful and you have, to, you have to deal with your enemies as well as your friends. But there's a pretty clear line, I think, between diplomacy and actually physically helping improve operational capability of armed forces. Again, I reiterate, I've not managed to speak to anybody who's actually doing it to find out firsthand their justification for doing it. Mm, uh, if I can just play devil's advocate for a moment, an offer of more than, say, £200,000 for a highly skilled training gig is very tempting. If people think they're not going to be allowed to sell their skills on the civilian market when they leave the RAF, could this become a recruitment problem, do you think? No, I, 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 do, I do take your point of being somewhat um, provocative there, but I know when I was serving the military flying jets, and I know it's true for most of my colleagues, whilst it's important to be paid for doing it, actually, it's such a rewarding enterprise. It's so challenging. You're flying the best military airplanes that money can buy. And I honestly couldn't have told you what I earned when I was doing it. The fact is that, that you're prepared to put your country first before rewards for yourself. You said earlier on when we were talking, uh, Sean, that you hadn't been approached by China to work for them. If you had been, what would you have done? What would you have said? What actions would you have taken? Well, I think it'll be. I mean, it's 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 a hypothetical, isn't it? Because it, is it the kind um, of thing, for example, that you report to the MOD? Yeah, and absolutely. I mean, it, even subsequently to the news story broken, I have been approached to say, look, if anything like this happens, can you please let the MOD know? Retired Air Vice Marshal Sean Bell. There, Michael Clark. I'm guessing our allies are going to be pretty unimpressed by all of this. Yes, they probably are, because, uh, you know, we have a reputation of being very careful and very organised in the way that we handle these sort of delegate issues. And, I mean, as Sean Bell said, RAF fast jet pilots represent a small cadre of people who are the gold standard of flying. But we've got to work out a way of making it clear, as Sean said, to them that this is not a clever thing to do. And I think, you know, if they'd thought about it a bit more, I doubt if they would have done it. I don't think they're behaving deliberately as mercenaries, but I think they've been very foolish and the story is very bad. One. This is Zitrap. Next to Ukraine, we'll do a virtual teardown of the so-called kamikaze drone being used to attack Kyiv in a moment. But, Mike, bring us up to date on the big picture of the war. It looks to me like Russia is losing more strategically important ground. Is that fair? Yes, it is. The essence for the Russians now is Kherson. I mean, it does look as if they are getting civilians out of Kherson, but it does look as if the Ukrainians are now in a position to take Kherson in the next couple of weeks, say. Certainly, they, they, there's going to be a fight for it. Um, and that will be a big blow if it happens to Russia's war aims, because Kherson is the only big city that they hold. And if the Ukrainians get it back, then that's not only a big symbol of their counteroffensive, but it is also strategically pretty important because it controls the water supply into Crimea and the big hydro dam at Novokovka. So this is the most strategically important moment approaching now of the counteroffensive that the Ukrainians have set up. And Mike, what is the thinking behind President Putin's new security decree? Martial law in the areas of Ukraine he claims to have annexed makes some sense. But why tie to security in parts of Russia? Yes, I mean, it's all rather loosely worded. And we've all been looking at the translation of these uh, decrees. It's not clear how it will work around Russia. But in, in areas uh, like Belgorod or Rostov, which are as on the border with Ukraine, there is a, a sense that this will allow Russian authorities to tighten up, to stop people leaving, to actually control what happens there. And clearly it's a symptom of the fact that Putin is getting desperate because the war on the ground is going 
from bad to worse, to be honest, for him. It has all the symptoms of a, a leader losing his strategic grip on the situation on the ground, which makes him very dangerous, of course. And so what about the sudden visit to Washington, D.C. by the Defence Secretary to meet his U.S. counterpart, who he met only a week ago at NATO? Downing Street's tried to guide us away from speculation that it could be because Russia could be planning to detonate a nuclear device over the Black Sea. Any idea of what's going on here? Well, yeah, I don't really think it was about the nuclear threat as such. Um, my guess is there was something else that they wanted to deal with face to face. But I, if I had to guess, I'd say that Ben Wallace wanted to talk to the Tiger team. This is the team that the Pentagon has set up to look at all eventualities, every scenario. So every time the Russians do something, Tiger team gets onto it and works out a range of options to give to the president. They've gamed out everything they can possibly think of. And my guess is that that's whatever else he was talking about, I think Ben Wallace would have wanted to plug into that so that as and when something happens in the next couple of weeks, Putin tries something different. You know, he's in inside the minds of the Tiger team group. If I had to guess, that would be my guess. Well, despite Ukraine appearing to have significant strategic momentum, it is still suffering badly at the hands of Russia. Air attacks far away from the main battlefields have continued, apparently in an effort to take down Ukraine's energy supplies. An increasing proportion of these strikes have been with Iranian-made drones, the Shahed-136, effectively a programmable flying bomb. Professor Peter Lee, an RAF veteran who is now Director of Security and Risk Research at Portsmouth University, has been telling me more about this drone. They probably have about an 80 or 90 kilo payload. So the payload is probably, say, four times the size of a Hellfire missile. That means that the explosion is going to be certainly big enough to destroy a building, but it's not going to destroy a whole area. It's claimed that it's autonomous, but I think it's probably more automated. So it will have programmed into it target coordinates. And then it has a loiter capability, so it can go and fly above an area for several hours. Then when it's in position, it will, at a certain time, probably a pre-designated time, it will fly into whatever those coordinates are. So it could be a building or it might be just an area. It might not be that accurate because you need to have at least decent GPS global positioning to, to get a very accurate strike. And I don't think the point of these is to have a very accurate strike. I think mm. the, the main capability is psychological. So it's not actually being live piloted as such, it's being pre-programmed, is that right? Yes, as much as we know from all the reports that have been made and in intelligence that can be gleaned and made public. And part of the reason for that is, if it was being live piloted, say from a satellite, that would be extremely high tech and very expensive, but a live link could potentially be disrupted. And does it have any other capabilities aside from being an explosive weapon? Does it feed back pictures or any other surveillance data? No, it seems to be quite a basic uh, drone, very basic engine. The optics good enough to hit roughly where they want to hit, but because they're effectively disposable, every additional bit of capability you put on there, so the ability, for example, to feed, to, to live feed images and signals back to a base somewhere, every time you have increased technology, it, is, it increases the cost and increases the cost significantly. So... It, it only really works as a, as a usable, disposable weapon for the Iranians and the Russians if the cost is kept down, and the cost is kept down by keeping them fairly basic. And is that what the advantage is then of using a Shihad uh, 136 over a missile that is perhaps cheaper and accurate enough? I'm not actually convinced either way. I think if I had a good missile that, that can hit a target accurately, I'd be sending a missile. So there's a, a good likelihood that one of the things that Russia is saying by using these is it's trying not to use as many missiles or it just doesn't have as many missiles as it would like. So this is the cheap option. And are they much easier to counter than a missile? Because they fly more slowly. Yes. It depends on the system, of course, that you're using for air defence, but it's easier to hit something that is larger and flies slowly than smaller or at least missile shaped that flies very quickly. So these are kind of mono wings, delta, delta shaped, so it's a nice big triangle in the sky moving at not much more than 100 miles an hour. So that would be a, that would be a good target to try and hit with an air defence system. And we've seen reports they're quite hard to pick up on radar. Why is that? If they're hard to pick up, it will 
be purely on their size. They have a wingspan of... The other alternative is that if it's flown really quite low, then it may duck under some of the radar capabilities. I think sometimes what the Russians tend to do is over overclaim on, on capabilities. And by putting the word out that it is somehow sneaking past the air defences, again, it increases the psychological impact on communities where it might be used. Drone expert Professor Peter Lee. Now, a first for BFBS SITREP. We're about to hear from a celebrated dance critic. Bear with me, caller. The story and stories of World War II have been told many times in many different ways. When they were first told, they came almost entirely from men who did the fighting and most of the reporting. But a handful of extraordinary women defied official bands to become war reporters. The dance critic Judith Mackerel stumbled across the story of one of them while researching a history of the Paris Ritz. It inspired a big change of direction for her writing and now she tells the story of the war through the experiences of six women reporters in her new book, Going With The Boys. I think even though more and more historians are beginning to recover women's voices and women's stories, there is still a sense that wars are written by men, for an audience of men, and largely focus on the experiences of men, which, you know, is not surprising until recently it was essentially men who were out there in the battle zones. Time and time again, when my six women wanted to get to the news, they were being prevented by the attitude of the military, which was essentially that wars were not for the weaker sex, that blood and noise and danger were going to be too much for any female journalist, that somehow there was something dangerous about women being present amongst, you know, divisions of soldiers. And most uncomfortably of all was the issue of, you know, toilet facilities. You know, would women require their own special facilities out in the battle zones? But it was, in certain cases, the very fact that it was so difficult for them to get to the news, that they weren't part of the official press corps, that they got to stories that men didn't get. So, for instance, Martha Gellhorn, who was furious that when the Allied Armada crossed the Channel to um, begin the liberation of France in 1944, 550 journalists were allowed to sail, but none of them were women. And she was so furious, so determined to get the story that she rode stowaway on a hospital ship and having arrived at Omaha Beach on day two, was actually allowed on shore because she was helping the medical teams collect injured soldiers. And unlike her male colleagues who were only allowed to report on the action from planes or ships, she was there with the fighting just going on behind the sandy cliffs. So simply by virtue of the obstacles that have been placed in front of her, her account was more vivid and more raw. And how did you choose the women you wrote about? Well, I came across the first of them, uh, Helen Kirkpatrick, by accident. Actually, I was was researching a previous book. This young woman arrived in Paris the day after it was liberated and had been invited to lunch with the writer Ernest Hemingway at the Ritz. They all got very drunk and their war stories got more and more kind of heroic and self-aggrandizing. But at a certain point, Helen said, actually... There's a lot of news happening out on the streets. It's time for me to go out and do some work. And Hemingway was all, sit down, sit down. You know, you'll never again be able to say that you were dining with Ernest Hemingway at the Ritz, you know, classic macho war ego. But she got up and left and uh, she scooped what she said was the most extraordinary story of her career, which was at the celebration of Thanksgiving being held at Notre Dame with de Gaulle and the other French generals. The Germans had left 50,000 snipers around the city. As the surface began, there was the beginnings of an absolute bloodbath with bullets just flying everywhere. The man next door to Helen was killed. This was the first thing I knew about women like Helen who had been getting to the front lines and reporting during the Second World War. One of the other women you feature is Claire Hollingsworth. She discovered the evidence of the preparations to invade Poland, the acts that would start the Second World War. Could you just briefly tell us how she came across that? 
Well, it was, this was amazing. She was literally a week into her career as a journalist. She'd been sent down to Southwest Poland. You know, Britain and France and Germany were still sitting around the negotiating table and she was not convinced. So she borrowed a diplomatic car, illegally crossed the border into Germany, just looking to see if she could see any activity. And it was completely reckless. She had no papers, no permission. She could have been shot as a spy. She was driving along a road just uh, near the German frontier, which was suspiciously lined with these huge Hessian screens. Luckily for her, a gust of wind blew aside one of these screens and allowed her to look down into the valley below. And there she saw nine panzer divisions pointed in the direction of Poland. That was the 29th of August. She filed through copy. Yes, they, the Germans are planning to invade. And then, of course, on the morning of the 1st of September, when she was awoken by the sound of anti-aircraft fire, she realised the invasion had begun. And amazingly, the British were still so convinced that you know they were winning at the negotiating tables that when she phoned through to the embassy in Warsaw, she had to hold the telephone receiver out of the window to convince <laughs> one of the embassy staff that yes, actually the Germans are now in Poland and the you know, war has begun. Really is an incredible account. Are you right that the Second World War was a defining opportunity for female correspondents? Why? Um, Partly because it was such a huge and sprawling conflict. Foreign news desks were obviously short of journalists. Even though the military were trying to keep women from the news, the actual war news, there was still so many stories for them to cover because of course, with cities being bombed, with refugees covering half of Europe, there were so many stories that women could write. Some women in Britain particularly came into their own reporting on the Blitz. I mean, the, the, the army couldn't keep the women away from those bombed streets and they were in a way braving as much danger as they would have been uh, in a battle zone. So the newspapers needed them. The fact that they managed by hook or crook to get there, the fact that they, they did come back with such extraordinary stories, uh, I think allowed them then to prove their mettle and although it wasn't a straight road to progress, you know, after the Second World War, there's no question that, you know, my generation of women did pave the way for, you know, women like Christina Lamb and Lindsay Hilson today. Judith Mackerel on her book, Going With The Boys. We talked about much more, the mental scars war left on these women, how a female perspective reveals different aspects of the war and also the motivation they share with people who sign up to serve their country. You can hear it all in an extra edition of BFBS SITREP online now. Uh, Michael Clark, it really is a fascinating insight. One of the things that struck me was the arguments used against women being war reporters. Were ar arguments being used against allowing women into frontline combat roles not that long ago? There were always two main lines of argument about women in war. One was that, as Judith Mackerel uh, said, um, somehow war is a, a man's affair. It's just too nasty, too obscene that women somehow can't belong in this environment. And then the other argument is that if women are in that environment, it upsets the men. The men don't like to see women in danger, still less like to see women hurt. And the men behave differently if women are around. They behave in less warrior-like ways. So it's always this, it upsets the boys. It's very interesting. It is the case. If you go to Whitehall and look at the cenotaph, you know, there's a cenotaph for women just a few yards further up Whitehall from where the, the, the main cenotaph is. And if you approach that cenotaph from a distance, it looks as if there are a whole series of bronze figures surrounding it. And as you get nearer, you realise that they're not figures at all. There are no people. They're just uniforms, as if they're hanging up. And there's uniforms of a, of a nurse and a firefighter, a pilot uh, and an aid worker of various sorts and a housewife's uniform, just aprons. And all around the cenotaph, there are no faces, no women, just their uniforms, just their functions. And, you know, some people have got quite upset about that because my office used to be almost opposite it. I remember a lady from New Zealand came. She said, who designed that? Who, did, who put that cenotaph there without a single figure on it? And I said, well, isn't that rather the point? That women have been anonymous in war, but actually they've performed all of these functions. And that's what the cenotaph says. Maybe it seems disrespectful, but at the moment, where we are in our history of gender equality, it seems to me to make a very valuable point 
It's been functions, not people. And I think Judith Mackerel's work brings out the fact that it's probably time to put the people into the uniforms. Professor Michael Clark, thank you so much. And my thanks to all of our guests. That's all for now. We'll be back with another BFBS SITREP next Thursday. Until then, you can keep in touch with us on Twitter. We're at BFBS SITREP. And you can always find us online wherever you get your podcasts. For now, though, from me, Kate Chabot, thank you for listening. Bye-bye. 